Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Pelgrim Press Gumshoe Swords and Sorcery panel for Gen Con Online. This is all about Swords of the Serpentine. So on behalf of Kat Tobin at Pelgrim Press, I want to introduce my co-designers for Swords of the Serpentine. And we'll start off with Emily Dresner. Hey, how are you? Hi, Gen Con. <laughs> Emily, tell them something about yourself. Uh, my name is Emily Dresner. I'm the co-creator of uh, Swords of the Serpentine. I'm also the author of the column Dungeonomics at Critical Hits, where I make a bunch of jokes about D&D &D and economics. And uh, I've been designing games for about 20 years. Fantastic. Uh, along with contributing author Matthew Breen. Matt, say hi. Hello. Uh, greetings from the future. So. Yeah, uh, it is currently four in the morning on Saturday here in uh, New Zealand. Um, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, if if I'm uh, not looking entirely awake, it's probably because it's sleep time. But uh, um, good to see, good to be here with you all. Matt has worked alongside me um, entirely throughout my entire time with Pelgrane, including Al Hoot Trail, who he was my secret co-conspirator. Um, as, and moving with through three years of Time Watch and now Swords of the Serpentine as well. When we talk later about the Swords of the Serpentine online GM and player tools, those are all Matt's babies. And finally, I'm Kevin Culp. Uh, I, as I mentioned, I started with Pelgrain back uh, with Al Hoot Trail, the fantasy Western game. Uh, and then from there, we published Time Watch, which is a gumshoe time travel game, and now Swords of the Serpentine. Over the next hour, what we want to cover is a couple of different things. We're going to talk a little bit about what the game is, what makes the game interesting and unique. We're going to um, dig a little bit deeper into that, and then we'll finish over, uh, uh, over the last 20, 25 minutes or so with questions from folks. So as questions come up, type them into uh, the chat box, the, uh, and we will record them here, and Emily, Matt, and I will answer them. Okay, fantastic. So, Emily, quick, give you, uh, so no, someone has never heard of Swords of the Serpentine before, actually for both of you, uh, give them the pitch. Hmm, the pitch. It is a, uh, it's a gumshoe game. It's a highly investigative fan fantasy game based in the sort of vein of Conan or Liza Lock the Mora or any of your, fam your favorite heist-based fantasy genre. Um, it's a, uh, an island city that's out in a lagoon that uh, the buildings are always sinking. So they sink a couple of feet every year and then the people of Eversink build on top of it. It is a city that's rife with factions, politics, backstabbing, evil sorcerers, grand prophets, uh, a church of dubious morality and, <laughs> and hijinks and um, plenty of opportunities to run across the tops of roofs at midnight and break into rich people's houses and steal their stuff. So it is an amazing fantasy RPG that's coming out this year. Yes. That's right. Uh, Matt, give, what, what would your pitch be? Um, so uh, aside from the, the setting details that uh, Emily's covered there from a system perspective i guess i would say that one of the uh, distinguishing features is that it supports um your your street level type adventures all the way through to the uh, prime movers and shakers of politics and business and so forth in the city so um if the pcs want to have uh, a hand in shaping the entire setting, then um, the the system is designed to cater for those sorts of uh, adventures or or scenarios. Um, so um, often in a, a city adventure, your um, pawns are moving at the behest of powerful NPCs, but uh, in uh, Swords of the Serpentine, there is the opportunity to be the the powerful figures that are shaping what's going on. I think that that originally came from, of all things, Ank Warpork and Terry, Sir Terry Pratchett's Discworld, where one of the things that he does fabulously, and especially the Guards Guards books with the City Watch, is lay out certain political factions within the city, right? Whether that's 
um, Lord Vednari or the Trolls or the Dwarves or the Thieves Guilds. And a lot of those books have the different factions themselves clashing against each other, which is something that we wanted to capture in Swords of the Serpentine as well. And we'll talk a little bit about um, how you do that. I think there's a couple of things which I, when people say, okay, so what the hell? Um, investigative fantasy, like, is that even a thing? And one of the things I find really interesting, they kind of surprised me when we started doing this, is that most fantasy is hugely investigative. You know, whether you're looking at Fafford and the Grey Mouser, um, and as they're trying to track down who's stealing gems from nobles across the city by using birds to rip earrings right off of ears, uh, or something as simple as there's a monster that's eating people, we need to track it down and find out where it is and what it did. Um, Oh, quite a few fantasy adventures uh, are tremendously investigative. And so what we decided to do was build a game that was, I think, simpler in terms of the number of abilities than quite a few other gumshoot games, but which captured that kind of byplay, right? The ability to talk your foes into submission instead of necessarily having to cut them down. The ability to manipulate politics. And in doing so, there's a couple of interesting rules which came out of that. I'm gonna summarize them quickly. Morale-based combat. So instead of just having to stab somebody, you can actually um, attack their morale instead and get them to surrender or run away in fear. Fairly cinematic combat. Um, we, I'll argue that high intensity combat has not traditionally been the sort of the hallmark of gumshoe. And so we wanted to uh, I dig our sorcery system. We'll talk more about that. Uh, and also narrative control. Um, the thing that I probably like best about this game is that it puts quite a bit of control for what's happening in the world and what's happening in the game in the hands of the players. So the uh, there are abilities, for instance, where, well, tell you what, Emily, tell us about laws and traditions. So uh, Everseek is governed by the uh, goddess Denari, and the goddess Denari is a goddess of, of commerce. And commerce doesn't work without having a, a baseline of laws, but nobody's actually gotten around to like deciding on what those laws actually are. They're sort of a communal hallucination in the city of Eversink. So anybody with laws and traditions can make up a new set of laws and traditions on a spot, uh, especially with the spend and just, and sort of mold the city around them to how the city actually functions. So if they've decided that, mm, I don't know, being able to pass bad checks on a Tuesday is completely legal, then somebody can have a spend and all of a sudden they can pass those bad checks, but only on that Tuesday because that is what they declared. So if it's on a Wednesday, that's no good. Um, so it's a, uh, it's a very powerful skill, but it allows the player to be able to morph how the city works around them and morph some of the rules, the ground rules of the city itself, so that the player can sort of swim right through that city and get to where they need to go. I think that if I had to summarize what the game is about, the game is about how the heroes and, then, and the players through their heroes change the world. Um, and that's one way. So for instance, the investigative ability for God and Lore, which is nothing but a reskinned trivia from other gumshoe games, but which tells you things that other people have forgotten. You can use that to gain information that might otherwise be forgotten. But similarly, you could spend one or more points of forgotten lore and just simply establish a fact is true. So if I wanna say, everybody knows that at midnight when there's a high tide, horses can talk. The player spends that point of forgotten lore, establishes that as a fact. It's true, it's always been true and it will continue to be true throughout the rest of the campaign. And so the longer you play, the more the players are basically shaping the world to be exactly what they want it to be. I think one of the, um, uh, in, in a way, it's a simple semantic trick, but one of the ways that you made more appropriate to high adventure was drawing a distinction between clues and leads, where a lot of gumshoe games, which are um, purely investigative, are, are quite reactive. You are trying to find the clues that lead you to what has already happened. Whereas uh, to cater for the sword and sorcery high adventure, often the investigative abilities are used to generate leads 
towards where something exciting can be happening. Uh, exactly. So, for instance, one of the investigative abilities is prophecy. And frankly, if the GM wants to um, show up and not have anything prepped whatsoever for the whole game, they can simply have the player who has one or more ranks of prophecy get a vision towards some sort of treasure buried someplace in the city, and, uh, and you're off and running. I think that the three things which I always, when I'm telling people about the city of Everson, the three things I tell them are similar to what Emily said. The city is always sinking. This has been happening for about a thousand years. No one knows why. The rate of sinking varies. But what that means practically is that because people are continually building onto the top of the roofs, you lose about a story per generation off of building. But that means there's probably 50 or 60 stories deep underground, ever since shaped like an iceberg in that regard. Uh, the reason it's sinking isn't because it's in a swamp, but if people want to, they can go hunting for old buildings and forgotten treasures and forgotten secrets down deep in the under basements and the undersea. And certain investigative abilities actually help heroes navigate that without any real trouble. That's one thing. The second thing is a goddess denarii. Denari is the goddess of civilization and commerce. Uh, she and everyone who lives in the city will be the first people to tell you that this is the best place in the entire world. They might forget that when they leave the city, but while they're in the city, that is absolutely a certain thing. And when you are in Eversink, you are inside of the goddess's body. And the goddess surrounds you and infuses you. Your Every building um, is part of her flesh. Every transaction that occurs from high-end... Uh, sales of goods to a beggar getting a coin and giving a small rock back. Each transaction is a prayer. Uh, sorcery isn't technically illegal in Eversync, but this is a swords and sorcery game, right? And that means that sorcery is intrinsically bad. So what's actually bad is creating corruption when making sorcery because corruption burns away the goddess's flesh and essence around you. It basically creates holes in her flesh that could end up killing her if it got too bad. Uh, the, uh, and so if you happen to be playing a sorcerer, you have to be a little bit careful about you do, what you do with the corruption. And the last thing which I tell people is that it's a swamp city. You can't really bury people in a swamp city so much. And so what people do when they die is that their friends or family make a religious, a funereal statue to them. Could be a little tiny mud daub statue, could be 20 feet high and made of bronze. As long as that exists, your soul is guaranteed a place in the afterlife. And if anything happens to it, if it gets destroyed or lost, either your soul is destroyed or it returns to the world as a ghost and interacts, um, uh, interacts with the people in Eversink. So what Emily's done in this setting is create this thing where there's a huge number of adventure hooks, and it's really easy to draw on any number of those. Okay, anything I forgot to say in terms of the sort of the high end? No, I think, yeah, I think you've got it, Kevin. <laughs> yeah. So let's, talk, uh, let, let's talk a little bit about sort of the background of the game and how we made it. Yeah. So you have been going over mechanics of, me, of this with me for like two and a half or three years, ever since we first started to hack Time Watch into a Swords and Sorcery game. Yep. Um, what do you and you actually ran a really interesting playtest early on that wasn't set in Eversync at all. What do you think the most interesting changes are between the game design did then compared to where we ended up? Um, so, for I mean, for me, um, my my weekly home game has been one flavor or another of Fate for the last ten or so years, and when when I did that uh, playtest hack one of the things that I included was uh, some aspect-esque uh, phrases related to each character and that uh, ended up becoming the drives uh, mechanic when it was sort of backported into the the, the main system um, and uh, that so that now exists on the character sheet as the the what is best in life question um, and uh, I've I've always liked that as a, a way to really nail down uh, specifics about who a character is. Um, I think uh, one of the the other mechanical changes that came through, which I think 
separate occasions I, I noticed in the manuscript and commented to you this is great um, having forgotten that I'd seen it the first time um, we we had the system of allegiances and negative allegiances and then um, the idea of temporary negative allegiances came up as an idea where you have maybe uh, overextended your credit with a faction. Um, and, and I liked the idea that you could have these temporary pull points that were acting against you with a particular faction, but it was a, a very clumsy way of phrasing it. And uh, at, at some point, uh, you you change the idea of allegiances and negative allegiances to allies and enemies, and then added favors and grudges as the the temporary versions. And that that small um, change in the name made it so much easier to express. And I think the the favors and grudges become quite a powerful mechanic for uh, showing the way that the PC's um, reputation with different factions is changing. Um, the uh, and I, I think the the other the other uh, mechanic that came up after the initial design that I'm quite uh, I, I I quite like is the staged disease mechanic where <laughs> most diseases have uh, you know between one and five stages where they can start off being quite um, mild and benign and and end up being um, completely character defining. Um, at one point, we had that working for curses as well, but I think uh, the some of the curse mechanics got cut for space. But yeah, yeah we might so. talk a little bit more about that. Um, mm. Excellent, Emily. So you, we don't you don't often see a fantasy city with this sort of convoluted a government and a power structure, uh, albeit one that the player characters can then go and gloriously manipulate to their own means. Right. What do you, I mean, maybe talk about what makes Eversync's power structure both interesting and fun and about how much of that is based in actual real world, real world history. So anybody who knows me knows that I am a gigantic history nerd, um, uh, the master of micro histories and the knower of completely random things. Um, but the way that Eversync's government is designed is at the very top, it's headed up by the Triskodane, which is a uh, mysterious group of 13 who are chosen exclusively by the goddess herself. She gives those that she picks to be a member of the Triskodane a golden coin, and they're even anonymous even to themselves. So nobody knows who actually makes up the Triskodane in the city. It could be your best friend. It could be that beggar on the street. It could be these very powerful magistrates. You have no way of knowing, and they have no way of knowing from each other. But the goddess has entrusted them to make the grand decisions for the city to decide to wage war, to decide to change tax structures, um, to decide that they're gonna outlaw the color purple. Uh, they make decisions, but they don't enact them. Uh, the people that actually carry out the decisions are committees that work uh, underneath the Triskodane. The, there's very powerful committees that run the city, like the Committee of Defense. They're in charge of the naval ships, such as they are for Eversink, or a Committee of Taxation who figures out how everything is run in the city. Um, those are usually the plum seats for the big nobles. That's where you're gonna see the people with the power, the movers, the shakers, the inherited seats, the seats where people bribe and pay a lot of money to get onto those boards so that they can have some sway over how the city works. Um, and, see, and seats app can be bought, but even they don't go and enact uh, the whims of the Triskodane. They have to hire people underneath them to go and enact the whims of the Triskodane. And that's where they start standing up subcommittees. And those subcommittees could be stood up or tore, tore down at will and can have any name that they want and have any mission they want and can either last for the entire existence of Eversync or can just last for that week, depending on how people decide they really want to be a subcommittee. And uh, most of them are just fly by night. So P PCs can do things like they can fight with other subcommittees. They can undermine other subcommittees. They can decide that they are the subcommittee to enforce the wearing of hats on Tuesday. Uh, hat subcommittees are really a thing. And those sub hat subcommittees who would rather have one kind of hat versus the other kind of hat to enact the power of the Triskodane, yeah, that's absolutely a thing. And the PCs can be on those subcommittees or they can try to undermine those subcommittees. 
a uh, funny fact is that the inspiration for the government committee system that's in Eversync is actually based on uh, uh, the Venice's government structure from the late Renaissance to the early modern era, about 1400 to 1600 AD, where they had a problem where everybody wanted to be in charge, but they could really only have one guy in charge who was the doge, and that was for life. So to be able to satisfy the needs of all the various nobles who all wanted to run the city, uh, and yet there was only one hat that they could wear is that they built out this very complex system of temporal committees and subcommittees where they all fought with each other of who was going to be on what board. So we took that and kind of took that concept of what was really in Venice and sort of ran it to its logical and somewhat insane extreme, which leaves us into these really interesting positions where, right, it's you can use law and tradition plus committees means that all of a sudden you can just decide that your committee is the most powerful in, 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 the, um, in the city. This is a, it's a nice way for players to be able to have a way that they can get into play. It's a way that players can get into adventures. They can have patrons. It's a way they can have enemies um, or enemies on other subcommittees or enemies of big sub people or have that one guy that you're trying to, to take down and what does that really mean for the city? So it gives the city sort of some structure of how it works instead of it just being sort of a flat city that nobody knows how to affect. And it gives the players these levers that they can go and they can, mm -hmm. they can change things at will, which is really, it's all about making fun. So that's really what the design is, is aimed at. I laugh when you were talking about how the members of the Triskidae and the secret government are secret. In one of our playtest adventures, um, my group of heroes ended up killing someone who turned out to be uh, not only on the Triskidane, but head of Eversync secret police. And the next adventure, after they accidentally found out they murdered this guy, they were hired to investigate his murder. Uh, because, they, because people in his group um, used prophecy to find out who uh, in the entire city was most likely to be able to find out who murdered this guy. And <laughs> they came up with the hero's names because they were the murderers, but Good they name. didn't know that. So anyways, it's a, it's a nice touch. Um, Kevin, um, with the, the projects that we've worked on before, you, you've said that you like to make games which are easily hackable for the, the people that are playing them. Um, and uh, Eversync comes with the, the built-in uh, frames and origins which which give you different perspectives on the city whether you know, everyone is an orphan or everyone is uh, in the city watch or so that I think there's a dozen or so in the book. Moving beyond Eversync itself are there ways that you have hacked the base system to run in alternate settings and uh, are there any settings that you personally would like somebody else to use the system to run for you to play in? Oh, good question. So I think you can both hack the system and hack the setting. I actually ran a hack of Emily's set of Eversync itself the other day. Grant Howitt, uh, who you probably know through having written the one-page RPG Honey Heist, has a brilliant game out there called Genius Loci, where basically like Neil Gaiman's American Gods, you're playing small gods, or actually genus Gina, loci in a small British town in the 1960s. Um, so you, uh, Matt, might be got the basically the god of the post office, and Emily, you might be the god of that big oak tree in the front uh, in the front park, and you are defending your town from the for uh, the gods of progress who are coming into your small village. So I ended up taking that rule set, packing it into Eversync, and everybody played different small gods in the city desperately trying to avoid being noticed by the goddess Denari as they worked out their own will. In terms of the actual rules, um, I've done a couple of different interesting things uh, from the pretty simple. I took the Swords of the Serpentine rule set and hacked it into 1930s two-fisted pulp action. I think in that case, it was Mace Hunter and the Pillar of Time. Um, and it turns out, it is a I had to change virtually nothing to make this a perfectly good pulp, pulp game. Uh, one of the things that I really like about what Sword of the Serpentine does is you can get really significant damage because unlike other gumshoe games, you can spend your investigative points to do extra damage. So for instance, in Serpentine, uh, Emily, you are playing a uh, noble and you might say, hey, I stabbed him. Can I spend my point of no points of nobility to do extra damage? And I go, nobility? And you say, oh, but 
when I was growing up, every year my parents brought in a different fencing teacher. And so I've learned a dozen ways to kill people. I would say, absolutely, you can spend your points of nobility to do extra damage. Uh, and so that, that flexibility came in really nicely into 1930s pulp. I'm looking forward to, I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to actually hack um, our rule system into a Old West game, because I want to kind of see how that works for gunfights. And most recently, and perhaps most embarrassingly, I used it as the basis for the game Sharks, which is a game of um, crappy B-movie actors acting in a crappy sci-fi giant shark movie, trying to deal with giant sharks even as they know that they're actors in the role. I turned out not to be the right rule set for that, but it was still an awfully fun game. It was, to be fair for Kevin, Shark was an extremely fun game. Uh, and that's that's certainly true. I'm just not convinced that this was the right rule system for it. Um, okay, the, hey Matt, um, what didn't make the final draft of the game and got cut that you would have liked to have seen make it through? Um, I think from from a mechanics perspective, not a whole lot. I think the 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 one thing that I lament slightly was we we had a, a subsystem for uh, magic item crafting um, where uh, people could invest either uh, temporary pull points or in some cases even ranks of uh, general or investigative abilities to create magic items. Um, for that and, in the supplement. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, it, it it was, I think, a little too niche and too finicky uh, to make it through some of the the word count culls, but um, it came with a bunch of hooks that uh, I, I quite liked for the the setting and for for potential adventures. Um, most of the things that that got cut that I miss are. Um, little flavor items which weren't quite little enough to fit in a sentence. So um, things that I, I think add to the texture of the setting, but were um, incidental. And, and um, one example was the uh, the nation of itinerant to Hora, where um, a a country sometime in the past was destroyed by a volcano and, and all the people that used to live there now live in a uh, city made up of a, a fleet of uh, ships which are sort of lashed together and protected by weather mages. Um, but when the, the storms get too bad, the city can split up into when it comes back together, the entire architecture of the city is different. Um, the uh, Eversinx native artistic form, the Due Monete, um, which was sort of a an improv um, drama performance with two actors on the stage playing four characters, um, was was something that I, I really liked. And and again, it, it it didn't make it through all the the cuts. And the the last one that comes to mind was the the silver contract scholars. So the the golden contract is the the founding document of Eversync, the contract between the original nobility and the goddess Denari, which uh, everyone knows is coming up for renewal after a thousand years. And in preparation for the new round of negotiations with the goddess of contract law. Uh, for generations, scholars have been studying everything that they can get their hands on uh, to understand how she thinks and how they can potentially outflank her in the, the future negotiations. Um, so drawing the, the, the line between good business and heresy. Um, so the, the, the silver contract scholars was an element which I think again isn't in the, the final draft, but it just added a, some some fun texture to the setting that um, I think that's showing up in an adventure. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, uh, excellent. The uh, Emily, you um, we've got twelve interlocking political fac uh, factions that uses allies and enemies. And you were talking about the post office the other day. If you were going to substitute in one or two new factions, what would you pull in and what would you pull out? As as much as as I want want to i would definitely put in some some kind of faction of interconnected librarians but i think <laughs> it's just because i really just like the thought of having underground 
uh, underground network of librarians who are controlling all the information, information economy in Everson. Um, so the, the 12 factions that are there are actually pretty exhaustive. If you actually think about the city, they, they, they all kind of, they complement each other really, really well. Um, to start actually trying to add a new one, it starts to get a little bit derivative. I think the big thing that I would probably want to add in is some sort of black ops or uh, Kevin mentioned the secret police. Um, I might want to swap out like a city watch for something that's a little bit darker. That's more of a, of a, a black ops or sort of thing so that characters can like feel like they're part of this investigative thing or they're coming from like Knights Black Agents or something like that. And they want some of that same flavor and it's in Eversync, but it's fantasy. So that that's one thing that I, I would uh, um, switch out. Um, I'm a little fascinated with the post office right now. So just that may come to an internet sometime near you this weekend. Um, <laughs> If 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 I if I get two hours of time, uh, I'm really really interested in how like we don't we don't talk about like the outside of Eversync except for I think in a very very small piece, but there's a whole outside of Eversync. So the big question is how do the diplomats actually go out there get all the information and bring it back because Eversync does have some ambitions to be a world power even though it's an itty bitty little city in a lagoon. Um, so how can you send people out to some other country give them a reason to do that and then have them bring information and trek all the way back home it's sort of an interesting thing it's a little bit outside of everything but it starts to break up some of the just the city and and sort of build in the environment so i would think that would be cool but, i think my biggest sadness about having to cut words for space was having to we had a whole chapter that was nothing about nothing other than 40,000 words going into the factions in glorious, glorious detail. And that's going into a supplement because that is way too good to uh, let go by the, oh, it'll be there. Oh, it will be there one way or the other. So yes, anyways, that's, uh, uh, that's uh, a big chunk of my fun. So, hey, uh, Kevin, why don't you let me ask you a question? Sure. So, uh, so we spent a lot of time working at that on the magic system and the magic system really is the heart of a good fantasy role-playing game, um, any good fantasy role-playing game. Uh, what are some of the trade-offs that uh, you and Matt made off when designing the sorcery system to make it both evocative and fun? And uh, how do you think about magic and then how do you think about prophecy? Sure, okay, good, interesting. So the way that magic works in Swords of the Serpentine is that if you're a sorcerer, you have a general ability called sorcery that you use to attack, right? And that might attack someone's health, it might attack their morale. You decide when you create your character. Um, and it's really sort of fundamentally in the, um, not that much difference than warfare attacking someone's health or the ability to sway attacking their morale. But what makes uh, sorcery interesting is that you can't even take that general ability unless you have at least one rank of corruption. Corruption is the ability to reach between worlds and rip raw power raw, evil, horrible, wrong power from another dimension. And that's what powers your spells. Uh, when you do this, and you do this to either give your spell a pretty significant damage boost or to create unique effects that can't be done any other way, uh, you create corruption. And when you create corruption, you can do one of two things. Internalize it, at which point something small or large changes on your body. If you are a fan of Fafford and the Grey Mouser, you might remember Ningobble of the Seven Eyes, one of the sorcerers that was the patron. Ningobble of the Seven Eyes had seven floating colored eyes inside of their hood. And in an Eversync sense, in a sort of the Serpentine sense, he was internalizing corruption and kept growing more eyes. Uh, but if you don't internalize it, you externalize it. That does two things. It burns away the goddess's essence around you, creating a place of wrongness that's more easy for ghosts to slide into our world through. Um, babies in this area might start crying and not stop for six or seven months. Chickens might stop laying eggs and start laying rocks. But the, uh, um, it also does a, does a number on the morale of your friends nearby as they feel this creepiness sweeping past them. I think the thing that most makes sorcery interesting is that you get one sphere, basically one theme per rank of corruption that you have. So if I am a planet sorcerer with two ranks of corruption, I might take the spheres of stone and plants, for instance. And I describe every single magical effect that I create with one of those two spheres. 
So when I attack somebody, I don't just say, oh, I do seven points of damage. I say, oh, I've got the plant sphere. The salmon, the, the vegetables they ate for lunch sprout inside their belly and a vine crawl, begins to crawl up their esophagus into their mouth and strangles them. Um, the, this sort of theme really creates a lot of, allows a player a lot of creativity in terms of how they describe things and makes sorcery feel both very unique and very different. So you could, for instance, play Avatar The Last Airbender with this system by simply limiting people to air, earth, fire, and water. Um, the, uh, you could do a disc world game with this system while limiting it to specific spheres that would make sense in the disc world. Uh, but because the player gets to decide what happens when they defeat somebody, you do that also with your sphere. So if I had, was a planet sorcerer with a sphere of shadow and I defeated a bunch of somebody, I might describe that their flesh boils away and their shadow is forever anchored to that spot silently screaming. If I have the time sphere and I defeat someone, I might describe them as simply leaving their uh, screaming baby. I reduce them in time to being a toddler and I leave their toddler behind as I continue to walk down the, uh, the uh, corridor past the pile of guards clothing and the small screaming baby. So you've got actually quite a bit of flexibility there in terms of, uh, in terms of how it feels. And corruption is intrinsically more powerful. So you can do some very unique effects and break the game, not break the game, but uh, create effects that you couldn't do any other way. So, okay, I'm looking at time and I wanna flip over to questions right now. So if you do have questions, please continue to type them in to the chat window. We'll grab them and we will ask. So here's a couple. Uh, how did Time Watch inform the design decisions from Swords of the Serpentine? Uh, I think it's probably a question for Matt and myself. Matt, any uh, anything that you see before I give my opinion? Um, uh, I think uh, one of the... I'm getting some echo there. Um, one of the things that uh, was um, quite revelatory, I guess, uh, during the design process of Time Watch was the idea that uh, effects are based on the general ability that you're using, um, not on the uh, narrative that you use to support them. So, um, warfare can uh, be kicking someone in the face or stabbing them with a knife or um, you know knocking a building down on top of somebody um, the the effect is they take health damage the way that you narrate it is fairly freeform um, so that that was something that came out of um, the way that time watch was developed and moved across into serpentine yeah um, I'd say that the other uh, significant thing that carried over was fewer investigative and general abilities overall. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I, I love Gumshoe, but some of the games have more abilities and more specific abilities, forensic entomology, um, <laughs> than you, um, that I personally want to have to try to keep track of. So Time Watch, for instance, combined all of the scientific abilities into one ability, science, with an exclamation point. Uh, and we took the same attack here in Swords of the Serpentine. You've got one group of social abilities which control how you interact with other people. There are four different professions, each of which has its own four unique abilities. And that's pretty much it. And so we, uh, we try to get as broad an ability structure as we can. Uh, Emily, here's a question from Rich Green. Can you explain how gear works in the game? So, oh, gear, gear's my, gear's my favorite thing. So, um, so gear's a lovely mechanic that was come up, come up with uh, Matt and, and Kevin. Uh, that's the last, it's the last line on your character sheet. And technically you can put anything that you'd like into the, uh, into your gear. Um, you can say that you have a uh, cloak of darkness or you have a particularly uh, sharp stiletto, but you can also carry a grudge or you can harbor ancient harbored resentment or um, memories of a long lost time or your twin buried inside your body somewhere or all anything that you want, you can put onto the gear that's evocative, that differentiates your character and makes it 
that character your own. Um, it's things that can be mental states, things that can be physical things, things that can be from the past. Like your gear is anything that is about your character that makes the character their character. Um, so I in Swords of the that Spirit, I yeah. really remember was the um, the Thieves Guild mistress, and in her gear was hundreds of thieves willing to jump at your slightest whim. Yes, and knowledge of everything in the city. That was one of her. It was yeah. her gear. Yeah. So it literally can be the gear can literally be anything, and you can use that to custom create the characters to be anything from like these these great patricians to like some sickly child on the street uh who happens to be a giant you know shadow sorcerer or, or flesh sorcerer and uh, anywhere in between so it's an extremely flexible but very powerful mechanic we wanted a um and i always say when it comes to swords of the serpentine unlike like time watch but if you look at a character's gear you know who they are right their drives their adjectives their gear you know who that person is for instance, I have up on my screen right now the gear list from a powerful serpentine sorcerer or a sorcerer who is slowly starting to turn into a snake person over the years. And their gear includes a long flowing mold green robe, a cringing slavishly devoted acolytes, a small silver dustpan to sweep up any scales that you shed, a beautiful mask to hide your now malformed face, the flag of the common city district where you were born, which implies that he's a sports fan. Uh, and uh, butt, of a, butt of a cow in a wine bottle, deliciously clotted. And finally, the mummified head of the first demagogue you tricked the city's commoners into overthrowing, which also implies that he's done it more than once. And you know, those things don't really, like that's not like in D&D &D where uh, suddenly that affects my combat necessarily. There is a small mechanical benefit for listing out at least five um, sort of signature items that you have, but really it's for you so that you look at your sheet and you know who you are. Uh, and that's the thing that I really love. My wife, by the way, gets credit for that design. She used to design D&D characters back in the 90s based on that sort of theory when we were writing adventure uh, tournaments, and I wanted to carry it through. Uh, so, uh, Emily, to what degree was Eversync informed by real world cities? Uh, it's, a it's obviously it's not a real world city. It's a it's a fantasy city that's on a lagoon. But uh, I did do a lot of extensive research on sort of Renaissance and early medieval cities to understand sort of how they worked, uh, how the different factions work, uh, how the society works, how the money works. If you look at it, the money is completely bonkers in Eversink. That's by design, um, very <laughs> deliberate design. Um, you know, is how the city interacted. Uh, I'm a student of systems, so I spend a lot of time looking at systems and then trying to find something that's a, a real world example and reflect that back into uh, my craft and how I create things. And there's a lot of Venice, but there's a lot of Florence. There's a lot of Barcelona. There's a lot of Paris. There's a lot of London in the city. Uh, that's all about uh, 1400 to 1650. Uh, spent a lot of time just looking at boats and how military works so that we could design an arsenal and how uh, housing worked and how that looks so that the tangle felt like it was real. Um, so there was a lot of there's a lot of real world research that goes into these backgrounds, but the trick is to take the threads out of the real world and to mash them up into a way that the setting feels alive and fun and works with the system. Fantasy wise, there's a lot of Camor from Lies of Locke and Lamora in the city. There's a lot of Ankh-Morpork pork in the city as well. And I'm sure there's a couple other, the, oh, and of course, Lankmar, absolutely. Loaded yeah, down with Lankmar. The, uh, uh, the uh, Matt, talk with me about how would you modify the game to do more traditional fantasy where using magic doesn't create corruption? Um, so, uh, I mean, the simple, um, mechanic that we have in there already is the idea of effectively lesser magic so the the thaumaturgy as a replacement for sorcery um where you don't create corruption but you also don't get quite as much of the uh, additional power that, that sorcery gives from uh, the perspective of trying to replicate D D, for example where magic is simply powerful but doesn't come with those uh, drawbacks necessarily 
Um, I think we've, we've discussed a, a couple of uh, ideas before. Um, one thought that I had was to make sorcery cost more, uh, sorry, make corruption cost more than other investigative abilities so that you get that additional power, but at the expense of some of the other things that you're able to do. Um, I think you proposed uh, a morale um, a morale cost to casting powerful magic. Um, so we're uh, internalizing corruption in uh, the Eversync setting, changes your body, casting spells to, to represent um, fatigue or mana drain or, or whatever could inflict um, a morale penalty on yourself. Um, so uh, I, I think that there are um, there are ways to do it. You you just need to find which drawback fits the um, the setting or the themes that you're trying to to replicate. You could easily do uh, Dark Sun and Athis. Uh, was mm. it was it Defilers who kill all the plant life around them when yeah. they when they draw power? Right, that'd be an easy way to do it. I can see a thing where when you draw on uh, what is currently corruption. Basically a big sort of pulse goes out that lets everybody in an eighth of a mile know that somebody just cast a spell there as the air ripples. Uh, so drawing people's attention to you and to that spot as a trade off for casting a spell. You know, quite frankly, uh, I've actually got a section in the, in the GM advice uh, chapter all about ways to sort of hack sorcery and hack the game for different things. I'm not convinced that you couldn't just run a classic fantasy or higher fantasy with it um, and just letting it go. The only real risk is that uh, people are more likely to take at least some sorcery when they're creating their character, which isn't necessarily a bad thing in a high fantasy world, um, but isn't what everybody necessarily wants. We have a question here about any plans to release a book on how to hack Swords of the Serpentine and sort of example hacks. Um, so, <laughs> Isn't that what blogs are for? Well, that's, that's kind of right. I have, a, I have a, there's a non-zero chance I'll eventually pitch to Kat Tobin and to Pelgrane some of the hacks that I'm doing, but frankly, they're kind of low down on my priority list. More likely I would, you know, do those sort of individually in a Patreon, pointing them towards uh, towards the original Swords of the Serpentine book for the important rules, that sort of thing. I've long joked that I want a pulp, uh, a 1930s pulp game named Face Full of Fist, where the cover is just some guy getting punched in the face. Um, the, uh, that, could, uh, that could totally do it. We've also sort of floated around the idea of a book which incorporates a couple different sort of mini settings all using uh, all using the same core rules with just some hacks for each one, and it's you know honestly it's it's whatever it is it's not going to be a this year thing it may not even be a next year thing, but as I sort of run down through the list of things that we're currently working on, uh, the uh, that's one something I want to come back to at some point. I also have actually it's worth noting is in Metatopia last year I play tested a superhero hack of Swords of the Serpentine. It ultimately, uh, it was fun. It demanded a simpler version of the rules and a more streamlined version of the rules to feel more like a comic book. But I think that that's something I'm gonna come back to in the next couple of months as well and uh, sort of poke at to see if it is still as much fun as I remember it being then. I think your um, corruption hack for the superhero game is, is one of my favorite changes. Yeah, that, talk that, about uh, it, talk about it, it's so good. So. Um, so the the idea with the superhero game is that obviously everybody has superpowers and so you're, you're all effectively using sorcery, um, but instead of uh, external or internal corruption, um, the use of superpowers uh, creates external or internal complications. So um, if you throw out a, a five point uh, energy blast, then you can either externalize that five points as collateral damage to buildings and bystanders and uh, making the immediate situation worse, or you can internalize that as five points of complications that will show up later. So maybe one of your powers starts acting up or um, your girlfriend breaks up with you or your aunt discovers your secret identity or um, you get named a vigilante on the news and um, have to dodge cops. So um, 
basically any time you use your powers for a uh, specific effect, you're either complicating the immediate situation or generating plot hooks to um, uh, to fill in the in-between adventure downtime. So, yeah. I knew that worked, Matt, when we were doing the playtest game and one of the characters punched a hyper-intelligent gorilla wearing battle armor through the Washington Monument as the <laughs> collateral damage from a five-point super strength spend. Um, the, uh, oh yeah, it works. It works beautifully. What did the Washington Monument ever do to you guys? Okay, you know what? <laughs> um, so um, we're coming down to the end. It's a couple more questions, one of which is for me and one of which um, is probably primarily for Emily. Uh, Emily, let me ask you this first. What's your favorite Eversink delicacy, uh, pre preferably from a food cart? Well, I always like like some kind of eel tentacle on a stick. Um, I, I have a belief that meat on a stick is always the best kind of, of food. So um, I, I would say that something that like is just on the other side of, of not quite alive, yet has a big skewer in it, and then it kind of twitches as you eat it. Yeah, that's the perfect ever sink food. It's just something that's a little bit disturbing, but not quite there yet on a stick. <laughs> Matt, favorite ever sink food? So uh, I, I have an NPC um, that uh, I've, I've chucked in at some point who is a uh, mercanti who has recently gotten the city's waste management contract. And uh, the, the way that she was able to underbid everybody else is she has uh, highly illegally imported swamp hydra uh, who will eat anything and then reproduce at an incredibly fast rate. And they're basically a, a ball of tentacles and teeth. Um, so uh, in order to hide the fact that she's doing this from the city, uh, she also launched a line of food carts selling calamari. Um, so it ends up being quite similar to uh, Emily's tentacle on a stick, uh, <laughs> but um, illegal at the same time. That's true. Uh, and for me, one of the events... Uh, so as part of narrative control, I start every game by saying, okay, uh, what's changed in the city since your last adventure? And I go around the table and every player says something that is different be now than was beforehand. So one of the things that came up recently during the start of a game is someone declared that it was the start of the eel run. We're just like salmon swim up river to breed. In Eversink, there's about a week or so every year where the eels swim up river, the very large, very hungry eels. And boy, when that coincides at the same time with some of the festivals and sports games that take place in the canals, that can be very exciting. Um, and so pretty much everyone does nothing but eat delicious eel for about a week or so, and then they're utterly sick of it. Uh, I love the fact that some of the absolute best cuisine in the whole city takes place in food carts in the worst part of the city. Um, the uh, And that all of the nobles have to sort of drag themselves across the beautiful map, uh, map by Drone Huginen, by the way, who also did our cover, uh, uh, from uh, Alder Hall into the Tangles or into Sa uh, Sag Harbor in order to get the best possible food. Um, so a couple things as we close up. One is that there's an amazing review and analysis of the game by Rob Donahue, which we'll post in the chat link right now so people can see what that is. Two, Matt Breen right here has done an astounding job of online to online tools. Uh, we'll also post the link to those. The hero generator can create a brand new hero in virtually instantly. There are a number of different sort of templates that you can pull down to have a new hero for one of your players in about 10 seconds, or you can take the time to build it yourself and change your character sheet into a PDF. For GMs, there are name generators, there are um, adversary builders so that you can create your own bad guys, whether they're monsters or people, incredibly quickly assigning them special abilities. And there's something else, Matt, what am I forgetting? Uh, the Triskodan. <laughs> right, and a deck so you can randomly generate the 13 people who currently happen to be ruling Eversync on the Triskodan panel. Uh, there will be other things there as well that we're not quite ready to announce, but which are super, super good. Um, okay, so as we close up, uh, let us go around. Emily, um, for you, what is one thing, what is best in life? Kevin, what What's is your best drive? In life? 
Kevin, what is best in life for me is to sit somewhere warm and read a good book while drinking a cup of coffee, to memorize endless useless facts from micro histories, and to write funny and sarcastic jokes on the internet. <laughs> Excellent. Matt, what are your drives? What is best in life? So the, there's a, uh, a Māori proverb here in New Zealand, uh, he aha te mea nui, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. Uh, what is the most important thing? It is people, it is people, it is people. Except for a nice MLT, a mutton, lettuce, lettuce and tomato sandwich where the mutton is nice and lean and the tomatoes are ripe. Mm, they're so perky, I love that. Um, but yeah, for, for me, um, I've, I've never been somebody who travels to do touristy things or to see places i travel to catch up with the people that i know and the people that i love so um yeah hey tangata and for me what's best in life um crappy giant shark movies um the uh uh the joy of spending time with friends and finishing a project you really love <laughs> after more than two years and getting it out so that other people can see it Hey, everybody who is currently watching this, thank you guys so much. We love this game. And I think that for me, what during the playtest series, the uh, playtest process, the thing that really made the difference was when someone told me, I think that I have finally found my game. So if that is the case for you, man, I hope you have as much fun with this as we are. Thank you, everybody, so much. On behalf of Matt and Emily, myself, Kat Tobin, and uh, Noah Lloyd, who's uh, handling all the background of this. Um, enjoy Gen Con online, and thanks for coming to watch. <laughs>